institution. So for about 30, 35 years, I've been managing law firms, uh, large and small, and started my own firm about seven years ago. And so now I try and bring that expertise of operations to solo and small firms. And one of the things that um, Alma from the Bar Association and I have been doing is doing these uh, monthly practice management breakfast series. They were going to be breakfast, now they're webinars. So this morning, we're going to talk about marketing. And we have two speakers here with us. Paula Madison Sierra. She is the founder of Power Marketing SF and Leo Manzione, who is a business coach and he works with Run Right Consulting. And what, what I think is valuable about what they have to say today is they both got a lot of experience in marketing for small companies and for law firms in particular. So Leo's a Bay Area native who's created eight figure uh, figures in client growth since 1997. He's focused on helping surpass the big revenue milestones of 1 million, 3 million, 5 and 10. Um, this is what he lives for and wins and the wins his clients see are everything to him. His method stems from looking at a business at five critical parts that have to work interdependently, which he'll explain shortly. Paula brings about 25 years of experience as an entrepreneur, lecturer, event planner, and advertising executive. Her broad background allows her to have an understanding of the operations needed to create and execute an effective marketing plan. So our agenda today is um, we're going to talk about some rules and guidelines that are from the State Bar and from the um, ABA. And then we're going to talk about um, a little bit about um, SEO and maximizing referral networks. And we're going to kind of interweave in there branding for firms as well. So that's kind of uh, what we're going to do today. And we have We have various different rules that guide attorneys and their marketing slash advertising. Um, they used to be governed by the California Rules of Professional Conduct, and then in uh, November 2018, the um, the rules for the websites anyway and advertising changed, and then the uh, California Rules of Professional Conduct became effective. And what what the rules are really geared toward is making sure that we as attorneys do not falsely advertise. We're not making assumptions about whether we can win or new, lose. We are not giving people the feeling that they can, if they hire us, we're going to definitely win for them. We can't say things like, well, you're not going to pay um, unless we win, if they're going to pay for costs. You can't say that you're certified if you're not certified. There are a lot of different things that are, um, are important and you're, you're supposed to not create unjustified expectations. So that's primarily what you're going to be looking at when you're providing disclaimers. So if you have somebody on your website that is saying, um, you know, Diane's the best thing since sliced bread, she did this wonderful thing for me, yada, yada. There has to be some kind of disclaimer somewhere or there should be, that says that that doesn't mean that you're going to also win. It just means that in this case, with these circumstances, we had a very good result. Something that re allows the people that are looking at your website, are looking at your marketing material, to understand that these are examples of what has happened in the past. It does not constitute a guarantee for anything in the future. So that's really very important. And that's one of the kind of overreaching guidelines for all the, for all the information that is on um, the Bar Association and the California Rules of Professional Conduct. And I'm sending out the, um, I'm sending out the I'm sorry, I'm trying to switch slides again. There we go. I'm sending out information with the slide presentation that basically outlines exactly what the State Bar and the ABA say. 
and it's long and it's arduous and you should really understand it and know it but keep in mind that the overall the overreaching understanding is you can't misrepresent misrepresent what you can provide for your clients they also have to have an opportunity to think about whether they want to hire you so soliciting to them on the phone and saying okay are you going to are you going to sign up now that they're supposed to have an opportunity to not feel pressured or have an attorney who is skilled at negotiating and skilled at um i don't want to you know um skilled at talking and persuading to persuade them to hire you so it always has to be a free will so if you keep those kinds of things in mind when you're marketing and then look at the specific rules for things that you're doing i think that you'll be safe from any kind of problem with the bar or the aba so if you have questions today we are going to be monitoring the chat so please feel free to put your questions in the chat. We will hopefully have time at the end to also answer questions. And then we're going to go from Leo and then we're gonna talk with Paula. And after each one of those sessions, we'll have a little bit of time to um, ask questions as well. So we're hoping that this is gonna be interactive. I know it's difficult in this forum, but please feel free to uh, join the chat if you would like to. So I'm gonna turn it over to Leo and take it away, Leo. Hi everybody, it's really good to be here. So as Diane said, I'm a business coach. So what I focus on are what we're gonna talk about, the five parts of every business, one of the key ones being marketing. So I know that's the point of our conversation today. And the spin that I'm gonna add, the flavor that I'll add to marketing is referral marketing and networking. And that's a big conversation. And I'll just put it this way simply, for service businesses. So many attorneys are in this position in the beginning because they're often starting a firm based on what they do really well. That's the best way in the beginning to market because it's fast, it has a quick feedback loop. You're involved with people, you can test your message. It has all these other things that make the rest of your marketing a lot more effective. So it's feeding you more information, data, resources, so it can create a really good reinforcing loop. I'll say one thing just really clearly is that in order to, to focus on what I call more, more passive, more long-term marketing, um, in the beginning, it can be a large investment, but luckily we have Paula here. That's where Paula can really help. She's the MacGyver of marketing, help you use whatever you've got, be it a piece of chewing gum, a paper clip, and a rubber band, and make sure that you've got what you need when it comes to marketing. So I'm really excited for the presentation today. We're gonna make a good job of really sandwiching it. I'll be talking about more of the in-person networking. She'll be talking about really how to build a strong online presence and how to get people through the sequence. So without further ado, let's go for it. Okay, so I'm going to move very quickly, obviously, going through three slides at once. So first and foremost, I hope you're caffeinated and ready to rock and roll because I'm going to run through these. First, let's talk about the five parts of every business. So five things. You have to create value. You have to market value. You have to sell that value. You have to deliver that value. And you need to support the operations of the business. Every business, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a small law firm, a huge law firm, a multi-billion dollar conglomerate or a nonprofit that somebody started in their backyard. Every single business needs these five parts running properly. And there's a key word here that I like to use when I describe these, it's the word interdependent. These words, these five parts, they rely upon each other because you can't really create value for people if you don't have people that you've marketed to and that you've then taken through a sales process where then they have expectations upon which you can deliver. And then all of that is for naught if you can't support the process so that it becomes repeating. Because if you only have one client, granted, some businesses only do one client, one and done, but that's not really a long-term business. So most businesses, almost all of them, are going to want to repeat that process. So this is something that I'll tie into. So the reason I share this is just that it's so important to know that marketing is a part of the process, but it can't be all of it. Because I'll just give you one quick example of what it looks like when these five are imbalanced. For example, if a business has marketing that's just going nuts, it's just really, really powerful, and you have all these people that are reaching out to you. Some of you in specific types of law right now, for example, bankruptcy law, um, you may be unbelievably busy right now. In fact, I know one bankruptcy attorney that is so busy that she's pivoting her business to teaching other bankruptcy attorneys how to be better bankruptcy attorneys. So it's great. Um, so marketing is great, but if you can't follow through on that, then you've just got a lot of people that are activated, they're in front of you, they want to buy from you, but they can't. 
And that actually tends to send them to your competition and that weakens your market position. Granted, I like to have the attitude, and this will tie into the network marketing that we'll talk about in a minute, of really looking for win-win-wins. Because that way you win, your clients win, and this is the strange win. This is just an aside to remember long-term. Your competition winning doesn't mean that you lose. It sometimes means that all ships get higher and everybody's better off. So don't be afraid to talk to other people that do similar things to what you do. Sometimes those can be the best referral partners. Those of you that are new to this, that might seem really bizarre. Those of you that have been doing this for a while might say, well, obviously. So let's dive in. So what we're going to talk about here when it comes to referral networking, man, you weren't kidding, Diane. It is not easy. Okay is three key things when it comes to talking about marketing via referral networking. We're going to talk about one unbreakable law, one love story, and one proven process. I want to keep it simple, concise, and to the point. So the unbreakable law is something that I want you to remember, tattoo in the inside of your skull and never forget it, because this is what I see people breaking or trying to break all the time. And here's the thing. With an unbreakable law, you can't break the law. You can only break yourself against it. I thought as attorneys, you might especially appreciate that. So you cannot sell something to somebody that they don't already want or need. You cannot do that. What you can do is you can make what you're selling look like something they want or need. That's wrong. And as, as Diane said, and this ties into the principles that she acknowledged earlier, that can get you in some pretty hot water. But the other kind of hot water that this can get you into is really confusing your target market. Because what you want to do is you want to get a really clear idea of who is the category, maybe it's a specific type of business if you're focusing on business law, maybe it's a specific type of B2C, a business to consumer relationship, a specific person having a specific issue. You wanna understand what is it that they want or need and then figure out if it's the right fit for you to provide that. Because here's the bottom line, if it's not, you're kind of wasting your time. Because the only thing that you can do is either pivot your business to serve them, which is often a bad call because you should instead focus on what is it that you can do best for the people for whom you can create the most value or you're going to make it seem like something that it isn't. So the question here is, what is it that they want and need? That's really what sales also, but also marketing really boils down to, is focusing on understanding that and then making sure that they understand that you know. So I want to be clear here on who I'm talking about when it comes to the word they. There are two parts to this. There's your customers and there's referral partners. We're going to talk a good bit about referral partners, but the thing is, is your customers, it's pretty straightforward. You understand what they need. Your referral partners gets a little bit more complicated because here's the thing. Your referral partners can be a very, very diverse group of people. And, and some of it is obvious. For example, attorneys receive a lot of referrals from other attorneys. So you want to understand for these different attorneys, who's their ideal referral partner? We'll talk about this later. Um, what's really valuable to them? And I'll share something with you that I'm sure you've all seen, and we'll analyze this a little bit more later. For some people, the, the thing that they want or need isn't obvious in the beginning. And, and believe it or not, there's some people that really just want to be a referral partner of yours just for the relationship. They, they love working with people that they like and they respect, and that's fantastic. Those are people with whom you can really have a decade, multiple decade-long relationship that's really, really fruitful for both people. And those are some of the closest people in my history. Paul is one of those people. Um, we have a really deep relationship that we've grown over time as referral partners. And that's really great. That can be one of the most rewarding business relationships there is. Same thing with Diane. Um, and to understand what's really important for people is the point of what I'm communicating here. You want to understand what's important. Some people want to collaborate and really build a team, build a tribe. That's unbelievably important to me. Some people, they're a lot more transactional. Some people, they really say, I'm going to give you a referral and I'm going to expect that you give me one back. And if you understand that, then you know how to transact with those people. So bottom line is it can vary a lot from people, but you want to lead with value. You want to make sure that you understand what is the value that these people want and how you deliver it. Just to hammer this home one last time, that value varies tremendously. There are some people that really don't value things that are valuable to other people. There's, there's a person in... Um, our networking style, I won't, I won't name him, but it's funny, he's very transactional when it comes to referral relationships, very transactional. And some people love that. Some people are all about it. And, and they really want to have that back and forth of saying, I'm going to refer you something, you refer me that back. And it works for them. It just clicks. And there's nothing wrong with that. Other people hate that. Other people, they really can't stand it. And they don't like the idea of looking at their, their customers as, as coins or what have you. And they create a straw man argument of, of what he's doing. And they try to tear it down. So the bottom line is you really want to understand 
How are they looking to have a referral relationship with you? How are the customers looking to have a relationship with you? And the more you understand that, the more you can fulfill it and the happier they will be. Enough on that. So what we're gonna talk about next is the right mindset. Because without that, what's the point? And here's, here's something that, that may seem rather obvious to people, but I'll say it very explicitly. If you don't have the right mindset, people can generally tell. There's a, a book called The Charisma Myth. It's a fantastic book, I recommend checking it out. Um, the bottom line is this, I think the author's last name is Cabane, C-A-B-A-N-E. C -A -B -A -N -E. Um, you can't fake it. And that's, that's the whole concept of charisma, is, is you've, you've experienced it before. You've been speaking to somebody, interacting with them, usually face to face, and you just get a weird feeling. And you just say, you know what, something's off. I don't know what it is, but just something doesn't feel right. I don't trust this person, I don't like this person, I don't really want to work with this person, but I don't know why. That's usually because they don't really have the right mindset. They don't have the right approach. They're not trying to help you. They're not trying to do something in your best interest. And what happens is when, when there's a disconnect there, there's something called micro expressions that people can read often without really understanding it. That's a whole nother deep rabbit hole on the internet to look into. But the bottom line is this, is simpler than trying to fake it. I know that whole concept of fake it till you make it. I'm not a big fan of that. Is instead just make it real. If you're really talking to someone and you genuinely care about them and you want the best for them, this is talking about referral partner and customer again, then that'll come across. Even if you're not that skilled in delivering that value or really fulfilling this referral relationship, that's something that will come across automatically. So the point here is by starting with the right mindset, starting with the right approach, all of these other things will cascade. So don't try to build upon a foundation. We'll talk about this a little bit more. That's really a win-lose. So the point is creating what I called earlier a win-win-win. It's a win for your customers, it's a win for you, and it's a win for your referral partners. The thing that a lot of people unfortunately focus on when it comes to interactions is a win-lose. It's a zero-sum game. If I win, you lose. Or if you win, I lose. And that's a really negative place to be. It's not a fun place to be in interacting with other people, and it's also one that people tend to not really support. Because if you see somebody else that thinks win-lose, you really fundamentally can't collaborate with them unless it's you two winning against other people and making sure that they lose. And that's not really that fun either. So the contrast there is talking about a win-win situation of looking for something that's synergetic, that's more powerful together. I'm gonna to use Paul as a great example here. When Paul and I are in networking situations, often people think we do the exact same thing. But when you dig into it, that couldn't be farther from the truth. One of my deepest pleasures is when I'm talking about marketing and very quickly in the process, I can say, all right, let me introduce you to an expert that can really take it from here. And then I'm going to help that client focus on the other five parts of the business. That is so fulfilling for me. That's one of the things that I absolutely treasure. And Paula plugs into that perfectly. So by that concept, that relationship creates a really strong win-win. Same thing with Diana. We'll talk about more in a minute. I work with some attorneys. But the thing is, is if an attorney needs that back-end support to really make sure that they can just practice law or they can focus on growing their business, I don't want to do that. I want to refer that to Diane so she can take care of that for them. And it's a huge win-win-win. I win, Diane wins, the client wins. So look for those. And the concept that's the intermediary step towards that is having the courage to say, I'm looking for a win-win here or no deal. Because quite frankly, there are enough opportunities in front of all of us that if you're not looking for win-wins and you're instead taking the no deal, you're kind of wasting your time. Or sorry, if you're taking a win-lose, you're wasting your time. No deal allows you to then transition over to win-win. You get what I'm saying. So this is from a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you want to learn more, highly recommend it. One of my absolute favorite books of all time. That'll help you really secure that mindset. So remember the win-win-win is a win for you, a win for your customers, and they win as well. Enter into the conversations with that mindset and the rest is really gonna happen quite easily. So just take a moment, jot down if it comes to mind of what and with whom can you create a win-win-win situation. Maybe it's, it's a referral partner that really would love to be able to send you this kind of business because believe it or not, they're out there. Some people feel like they're bothering the referral partners of saying, oh, they don't wanna send business to me, I'm not the best option. Well, find the people for whom you are the best option or become the best option and that will make all of this so, so, so much easier. So this goes back to that question of for whom can you create the most value? So I want you to dig into your business model. I want you to really think about it and say, okay, how can I help these people and who else are they working with? Because the concept of a strong referral partner, and in case that hasn't really been clearly communicated, a referral partner is somebody that can send you business consistently. Ideally, people that are essentially said, hey, 
you need to work with so-and-so. You've already worked with me for this. You need to work with so-and-so. Like when I refer to Diane, it's a very natural referral of saying, all right, you need to make sure that X, Y, and Z within your firm is taken care of. They're in great hands with Diane. Done. You need to make sure that your marketing is really clearly understood by the MacGyver, Paul, who's going to help you see a fast ROI in the beginning and then scale up from there so that no matter what, you've got your outsourced marketing department. Straightforward. So the distinction, too, that I want you to make as you're qualifying your referral partners is how often are they seeing your ideal referral, now that you know for whom you can create the most value. I did an analysis. This was a, a networking group in Oakland. This was a few years back. But I looked at the top performer and the lowest performer when it came to sending referrals. And this was really fascinating to me. The lowest refer, he saw 30 people per year. The top refer saw 30 per week. And this was really fascinating to me because it wasn't due to any difference in intent. Because granted, the intent, like I said earlier, is critical. But now we're talking about the next level. This was simply exposure. And to take it one step further, the gentleman on the top that was seeing 30 people per year was not seeing them in the context of being an expert. He was seeing them in the context of, I think you should really work with this other person. It was completely out of his lane. He was not a qualified or really ex expert person in this position saying, you should talk to this nail salon or you should talk to this, this hairstylist. Buddy, you got bad hair. Why are you referring me to a hairstylist? I know that's mean, but it's for, for humor's sake. But the point is, is a lot of people are trying to make referrals or trying to receive referrals in that context. And it's just not that powerful. By contrast, this gentleman on the bottom, 30 per week, he was an absolute expert. Every single person that he was talking to, he was a financial advisor, every single person that he was talking to was just waiting to hear, oh, I, I trust you, you're an expert, you're helping me with this, you're doing a fantastic job. So for all these other problems, they would bring their problems to the table saying, hey, can you help me with this, 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 and this? And he would make all these introductions that he had really streamlined to people that he knew, liked, and trusted that could do a good job. So look for the people on the bottom. Look for the people that are seeing your ideal referral all the time, and you'll see a really, really high return. Because the point here, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, is if you have a collection, and a collection's a weird word because these people aren't, it's not a utilitarian relationship. Remember, it's a win-win, so it's a win for them as well, and we'll talk about what that looks like. When you have that, that list of people with whom you're really building those relationships, that's a huge boon for everybody. It's a great thing, and they're out there, so you want to find them. So talking about Diane, and this is a really, can really I, great example. Can I interrupt just for one minute? Yeah, please. Oh, I'm sorry, before we move on. The other thing about having a referral network is when you're referring uh, clients to another attorney and you're getting a referral fee, the client needs to know it. There are certain things that you need to tell mm -hmm. the client about that. So if you're in a, in a referral situation where you're feeling like you have to pay somebody instead of having more of a, a, a commerce because you have relationship with them, um, it's a very different type of referral as well. So just thinking about that in line with referrals, just to keep it in, just to keep it in line, just to throw that out there. Remember when you're referring to other attorneys and they are expecting a fee or you are paying them a fee, it's a completely different thing than what Leo was talking about. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And, and here's the thing. There's a concept called reciprocation, which is a really, really powerful drive that all human beings have. Um, that's something that a lot of people use to their advantage. One of the most famous examples is um, when you go to the car dealership and they give you a certain, I don't know, a bag of chips, a soda, something like that. They give that to you because there's a high return on investment. It's probably the most valuable case of sodas they've ever purchased because it leads to people upgrading. And believe me, an upgrade is a lot more expensive than a can of soda. So there are people that are out there, and these are often people with win-lose win, thought processes where they're saying, oh, like if, if I give this person this, then they'll give me something much more valuable. And, and that can be a precarious relationship. So that's why I always preface this conversation with that proper mindset of looking for a win-win. Because then it's not so much of, let me see how little I can give you and how much I can get. Classic ROI calculation, which kind of breaks when you look at people. Um, and I talk about ROI all the time. That's a whole other conversation. But instead, it's how can I really invest in this relationship? How can I really be with you here so that we are really kicking butt together? So this is a great segue into my conversation with Diane. So, I work with attorneys, I work with all kinds of people, but what Diane does is she's really specialized her firm. Not only does she have a lot of experience working with law firms, but she's there to make sure that they have all of this resource, all these supports, so that they can just get back to doing what they love best. Some attorneys want to be rainmakers. They just want to go out there, they want to get all this business, they want to have this firm that runs behind them completely oiled and just gobbles up every single case that they hand their way, and then it just 
takes money out the other end. That's a beautiful system that Diane is really good at creating, especially people that are in the early stages because the opportunity cost is tremendous. But then some people, and this is a conversation that, that I have with a lot, they just want to practice law. And that's okay. Both situations are completely okay. But in both situations, Diane is a great resource. And the way that I can explain this to you so concisely and the reason that I can explain it to you so concisely is because Di Diane and I have created a referral relationship over the years that makes this really easy for me to explain. So the language that I just used with, with you and in this conversation is one that I explain to people when I send them her way. So that's created a win-win relationship. So your conversation should be as streamlined, as simple, and even better for the referral partners that you have that are going to be a big part of your business's success. So what I'm going to talk about here is another relationship that I have with somebody that, that's really helpful and that I'm actually going to share with you. It's a gentleman named Sam Lee. So Sam is the guru when it comes to networking and referral networking specifically. And this is a concept that he's really teaching. So I put his email address on here. Reach out to him directly if you have questions about this. He's a fantastic resource for understanding not just who sends you business, but understanding who refers to them. He has a whole methodology that I won't get into here. He'll teach it to you. This is a resource that, that's free um, what, that teaches you, okay, how do you, quote, unquote, activate somebody? Because here's the thing, and I want you to think of the inverse here. There are a lot of people in networking capacities that they're just kind of there. And I don't mean that negatively, and, and definitely we don't want to be those people, but they show up to these events. They, they're there, but they're not really going to go out of their way to send you business. They're not really going to go out of their way to help you in your business. They're really just there either to, to socialize or they're just there to receive. And those are people that, that just from a business perspective, this isn't a human judgment on them. This is just from a business perspective. It's just not a good use of your time. So one of the ways that we make sure we fall out of that category is by being somebody that can really contribute to somebody else's business. And that goes back to what I said earlier of understanding what is it that these people value? Maybe what they value is a specific type of referral. So if, if you can find either somebody or that kind of type of referral for them, that's unbelievably valuable. For some people, it's a specific type of resource, an introduction, a book, just some conversations they want to have with you. I have so many conversations with people like Diane and Paula about my clients, and sometimes that doesn't become referred business, but that's tremendously valuable to me, and it's something that I make sure that I figure out how I can reciprocate with them best I can. So bottom line, message Sam if you're curious about this. You want to figure out who is it that your referral partners, people that send to you, are looking for. And one of the best ways to do that is to figure out who refers to them. So we're going to go through a couple questions here in a bit. So I, I, I want to emphasize something first, though, is you have a duty, you have a responsibility to find these people. And, and I don't just mean your customers. And, and that's something that I know seems strange. Well, of course, I have a duty to find my customers. I need to make money. But the thing that, that I find myself telling a lot of people, and, and over the years it's become no longer surprising, is a lot of people feel like, oh, I, I just... I, don't, I need to interrupt my clients. I need to bother them in order to have them become customers. That's not it at all. The people for whom you work, you lawyers, you people doing this amazing, incredible work right now where a lot of people are suffering, there are people out there that just need you. So I want you to take that responsibility and really, really deeply ingrain that and then allow that to, to cascade into your work and your, your searching for these referral partners because those people are also doing amazing work and they can not only be great resources for your clients, but they can also be a source for those people that really need you. Because the, the vision that I, I, I want you to have is if you're really a technician and you really just want to do the work and within your firm, then you should be busy nonstop. And you should be busy not only working in the business, but on the business in a good balance so that it continues to grow and provide for you and your family and help more and more people. The vision, if you're looking to be more of a rainmaker, I know that's kind of a binary analysis, but if you want to be more of a rainmaker, it's having this huge machine behind you that's constantly growing, iterating, getting better. You have a responsibility to create both of those situations because these people, like I said, they truly need you. So the love story is what comes next. And the love story, believe it or not, involves you. So I want you to think about your best clients. Just take a moment, if you're listening to this recording or if you're here live, uh, make a note to think back and list your best clients over the years. Um, if you're new to this or if you haven't had any clients, do some research. Figure out who are the, the clients you'd like to work with. Who are the people that you worked with in other capacities that were really good fit for you? Because believe it or not, this is not an isolation. The, this part of your life, this career that you just started is often a continuation of what you were doing before. So there are certain types of people. And I mean, maybe people that are more data driven or people that are really a lot more people driven. You want to understand the kind of person with whom you collaborate well, because different personality styles, and they, they often oversimplify the unbelievably complex phenomenon that is the human being. Um, but you want to have an idea. You want to have an idea of what were the best situations you worked with in the past so that you can really start duplicating those moving forward. You also want to think about your best referral partners. 
And again, some people may have never had a referral partner, but think back to somebody that helped you in a different capacity or think back to who could have been a referral partner. And remember the context I shared earlier, 30 a year, 30 a week. You want somebody that's down to the lower part of that that's seeing more and more of your ideal clients over time so that you can find those people so you can really get them into your tribe so you can not only have them help your clients but also with their help help your clients better and then also help them help their clients better so let's talk about finding those people so there are a couple questions i want you to answer and this is something that i do recommend coming back to the video because we're not going to spend all the time on this that we need to um because this could take you an hour alone so ask yourself these four questions who is your ideal client Take a moment, be bold, really think about, okay, who do I want to work with and who do I work with best? Don't be, don't be overly aggressive here because some people answer this question of, oh, I'd like to work with somebody that's willing to spend $100,000 for two minutes of my time. Granted, that's out there. Uh, there are examples of that. For example, um, I think Mark Cuban was on this, this coaching platform where he was charging some absurd number for like 15 minutes of his time. There are people out there that will pay absurd amounts, but the thing is in order to get there, it might make the meantime a little difficult. So really think back to those ideal clients in the past and also think back to what your business model and, and your expertise could, for whom that could create the most value and really get a clear idea of who that ideal customer is. And I'll tell you this, your ideal client, that hypothesis is supported by doing work with those people. Next. You want to understand who could send you those clients. This is, this is borrowing from Sam's questions that I recommend talking to him about. But if this person that refers this ideal client to you, if you know who they are, you know what category. Maybe it's a estate planning attorney. Maybe it's a, a business coach like myself. You want to understand who those people are so that you can really start connecting with them. And then you want to figure out where can you meet those people. Not only your ideal client, but those referral partners. And then last, how can you provide value for them? So I'm going to tell you about a form of value that I provide for people just to give you an example. This is the Attorney Action Club. This is an event that meets once a month, and now we're meeting twice a month online, where people show up and we talk about COVID-related topics currently, but people receive free MCLE. So it's a great resource for attorneys. It's a great way for me to, as you saw in that previous diagram, activate people that are referral partners. Because here's the point. This is really easy. I mean, we buy lunch, or when it was in person, we bought lunch, and the MC Lee credits, we have a good system for that. This is actually started by an old client of mine, because there's the natural answer to, hey, I receive a lot of referrals from attorneys, so how do I give more value to attorneys? And he's received already seven figures worth of business from this event alone, while providing a lot of value to the people in it. So you want to find things like this for yourself, and granted, you're welcome to invite people to this meeting, for whom it's an easy, almost automatic way of providing value to somebody so that you can really immediately identify yourself as, hey, this person means business. This person really cares about me and my business and they have the ability to follow through. That book I recommended earlier, uh, Charisma by uh, Olivia Fox Cabane. Um, she talks about charisma being three things. I won't bore you with all of them, but one of them is power. And power, simply put, it's not the ability to, to dominate somebody else. It's really the ability to help somebody. Because if you're talking to somebody and you really like them and you trust them, but they really can't help you, if this is during business hours, your, your time really should be spent elsewhere. So this is how you demonstrate that you are one of those people in a referral relationship. Hope that makes sense. So the proven process that I promised I would leave you with, you want to identify your ideal client. Two, you want to list who you can easily, who can easily send you this ideal client. Three, you want to be able to create value for them, potentially their ideal clients, but not necessarily. Four, you want to keep growing and refining your list until you have enough solid referral partners so that you can have this pipeline of people coming to you. And this is something that, that a lot of people, I mean, it, I can't tell you how often I see people that have businesses that are referral only. And some people, they struggle with that because then they don't have other sources of income and they need to talk to somebody like Paula to set up those other marketing pipelines to get their own stream of customers to them. But some people with referral relationships alone, they're fine. So if you're looking to really build a referral-based business, this is literally the script. This is what you want to follow. There are obviously more nuanced details to it, but this will help you get there. And then beyond that, and I'll tell you this, and this is actually a really good segue over to Paula. I, I look at businesses in terms of bottlenecks and, and, and really from a systematic perspective. Um, I think every business should not only have a strong referral relationship pipeline, but also really the kind of stuff that Paul is going to talk about, about setting your stuff online. It makes a business that's more diversified. It makes a business that's more resilient. And also it just makes a business that, that gives you more ability to help other people. Because in referral-based businesses, what happens often is there's a lot of ups and downs, and it's difficult to really plan around that. So instead, having a business that's more leveled out has both parts. So to wrap this part up, 
um, I'm going to share with you a couple things that you could do. If you are not doing any in-person networking, here are two resources that I really recommend you consider. Going backwards, if you've been doing business more than 10 years, you qualify for a group called Provisors. That's a great organization. I just came out of one of those meetings this morning with 70 other professionals. It's a great place to meet and network with other people. But not everybody has been in business for 10 years. If you haven't, you can join BNI. BNI is in a similar group. They hate being compared. Uh, or at least Provisors doesn't like being compared. But BNI is a great resource. Um, there are so many meetings. There are a thousand meetings in this time zone. So if you wanted to block off, I kid you not, almost every single morning moving forward, obviously not Saturdays or Sundays, you can be at a networking meeting. So you can visit these other groups. You can, you can connect with these people. You, Paula is a, a member of a group called BNI Stars that she may be able to invite you to. Um, this is a great way to promote yourself. And, and there's another point here, and this is something that, that's a little subtle, but I'll share this with you because I share this with all my clients. BNI is great for, for getting referrals and building networking, but I would argue even better than that, it's great for practicing. It's great for being able to give a pitch on short notice. It's great for being able to learn how to qualify and disqualify potential people coming your way because people are going to start coming your way, and that's how you learn how to explain who's the right fit. So if you're new to this, BNI is a great resource. If you're experienced with this and you're just looking for more, check out both organizations. If you have any questions about that, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I got a whole slew of processes I can share with you that work that I've been refining over a long period of time. So last, this is how you get my help. So I'm going to send this out in chat. Um, simply put, there are two ways to get my help. I give away my time. Um, this is something that's my way of giving back and helping people at this time. Some people, if they need my help and they become clients, that's a whole other conversation. But the bottom line is I want to make sure that everybody right now, especially that needs help, can get it. So if somebody wants what I call a complimentary session, it's me sitting down with them from 30 to 60 minutes. We're going to look at bottlenecks. We're going to figure out what's going on. Reach out to me. It's a gift. Um, these are some ways to get in touch with me. Email, phone but I'm here to help. So if you just want to know about networking referral processes, you just want an introduction, or you're looking to really go in depth, that's my gift. So thank you so much for having me for Diane. Thanks for having me in this meeting. And I am really happy to hand this over to Paula, who's going to tell you about how to diversify those marketing pipelines and really make sure that you're getting people offline. Thank you, Leo. I'm going to interrupt. One of the things that we do on these sessions is we say three random words during the sessions and then at the end, later on today, Alma will send you a survey that asks you what these questions are. When you answer that question, those, that survey, you will get your uh, CLE certification. So since I missed the first opportunity to do this, I'm going to give you two words right now. So the two words that you have to remember are gum and glasses. Gum and glasses. Okay, take it away, Paula. Okay, perfect. Well, let me do a little quick practice here with this uh, interesting um, uh, movement. <laughs> and okay, so I'm touching my screen and down. There you okay, go. There we go. Okay. Um, thought I wasn't going to make it there for a second, guys. So my name is Paula Madison Sierra. I run a company uh, here in San Francisco called Power Marketing SF. It's an offsite marketing department. This morning, I'm hoping to give you guys some very tactical and actionable items to take away with you. Um, SEO has been long known as that voodoo area of, um, of marketing, and how does it work exactly? It's a powerful tool, but I also wanted to mention all the other pieces that should be a part of your digital marketing uh, process as well. So. Um, let me just get past that. So the good news is that marketing hasn't changed. Marketing hasn't changed in a long while. And now we're in the digital uh, version of that. That hasn't changed as well. Digital marketing is still marketing, and marketing is about consistent communication. As Leo mentioned earlier, uh, you know, honestly, people can't do business with you, by the way, if they can't actually find you. There has been so much going on with Google, and yes, Google will be the main focus of our discussion this morning because they do hold the lion's share of the market and is the place where most people go if they're looking for pizza near me or an attorney or um, an op operational help, what have you. Let's face it, we get on Google first, and that's just the reality of it. So we will be, I will be using them as the mainstay for our, my discussion this morning.
Okay, so, so uh, SEO is part of your larger landscape, and of course, we're going to discuss that today. However, if you want to think of a proper digital plan, you need to not only think of SEO, because the SEO plan and strategy will, of course, be linked to your website design and plan. Notice I said design and plan. So we're not just going to design a website and set it and forget it. That website is not an effective website, guys. Email uh, marketing and automation, very strong right now because we are sheltering in place. We need things that are going directly to the client, hitting their emails instead of being somewhere else. So we want to be seen. Um, Pay-per-click. Again, it's, it's what it's, it sounds like what it says. So it's on Google, you're advertising, you can pay, if they click onto that, they're getting to whatever focus you want them to get to, whether it's your website, um, a class that you're doing, um, a new service that you're offering, social media um, marketing as well. And of course, the one that's tied to all the others, you need to have a proper content strategy as well. I'm sure you've heard this about content, you need to provide content, great content. And of course, you're thinking to yourself, great content, I didn't really think about that, right? <laughs> of course, it needs to be great content, right? But, um, and again, I'm showing you this entire mixed bag. You don't have to do all of it. But my thought is to you is that if you're going to come up with a strategy, you need to have things that support each other. And I'm gonna break these down really quickly for you and show you, you just give you a quick example of exactly how they would support each other. So you design your website. By the way, guys, I know that, you know, right now, um, the big thing that a lot of you guys are hearing are sales funnel and landing pages. Well, you don't have to have a website. You just need to have a, a landing page and that's fine. Landing pages works wonderfully, but not for everyone. It really depends on what's your goal and what you're doing. Landing pages are fantastic for people who are building themselves as personal brand. It's wonderful for classes that you're doing. It is wonderful for um, targeting a specific item. In my personal opinion, I don't think it's that perfect for attorneys um, uh, um, as well but a landing page with a website is a fantastic complement to getting clients in, especially if you're offering something that Leo's offering, like a free 20 minute, 30 minute um, class session with them. They work perfectly together. Your website should be your mainstay. It should be kind of a foundation item of all of your other items. Social media is exciting, but guess what? Unless you're doing, and actually, by the way, even when you're doing a paid account on LinkedIn and you're paying for advertising on Facebook, bear in mind that the platform, your page, does not belong to you. It belongs to them. So if you have any kind of infraction that they think, you know, well, you did this wrong, you posted incorrectly, this was wrong, that was wrong, they could rip you off and put you in the the, the box for a second, and LinkedIn, by the way, does that a lot. If you cross the line, and there's sometimes these rules are changing, <laughs> and now you're not able to connect with your connections the way you want. Facebook does it really regularly as well. I have clients who are often taken off, and you either have to wait until you plead your case, if you can find someone to plead your case to, or you may not even get back on and you have to create another page and now all of that equity is lost. But you always have your website which belongs to you. So the website should be actively managed and I will speak about that later on how that calculates in. Um, your email, um, let, just one thing about email marketing, email marketing doesn't normally convert clients to your business. The, the email marketing are for clients that you already have. It's for retention and maintaining the relationship. So you're sharing with them your expertise. You're letting them know that there are other services besides the one that they, um, you, they, you, they contracted you for. 
it's like, okay, you've done this with us, but did you know that we offer all of these other services? That's what email marketing is for. And of course, automation, if you don't know, these are things that can be connected to your website. So if someone visits you, you can keep the relationship going with them and it is basically customized. It's only going out to that person. You can do it over a period of three weeks, four weeks. Some folks do it over the entire year where you're just simply sharing with them, again, great content. Pay-per-click we talked about is advertising on Google and your social media strategy is broken up into two pieces. It's advertising and posting. And by the way, that's a whole nother discussion, but the two belongs together. Um, a quick little tip before I move on and get deep into SEO. As an example, Facebook. Let's say you have 100 people on your Facebook page, your business Facebook page. Back, I'd say a couple of years back, they would allow at least if you post something, let's say today, only 25% of that audience would actually see your posting. However, advertising for Facebook has gotten very strong. Again, they are a company just like we're a company and they're about their bottom line and increasing that. And bear in mind, remember I told you, your pages does not really belong to you. It belongs to Facebook. We are there at their, you know, at their permission and they can take that away from us at any time. So they're trying to build their businesses and so they've reduced it dramatically. Now when you post something on Facebook, you're only getting a half a person. 0.5% of, is, is, of that is going out to your actual fans. So you're only getting about a half a person. The thing that's going to open that up for you in the land of Facebook is unless you add monies to it. So mixing your great post with dollars is going to help push that out. And really at the end of the day, I know we're in this digital world and I think folks look at marketing as well, it should be free. Marketing is not free. It is absolutely not free. It is a combination of your dollars and, your, and the actions that you take. And it has to be budgeted into your day to day. So when you think of a digital strategy, I don't want you to think tactics. And that's what I hear often where folks simply go, um, and actually I'm just going to pop up really quickly. Um, yes, Leo, I actually did exactly what you told me, which is if you click onto the right, it keeps moving forward. <laughs> you know, something I'm going to stop there so it won't keep progressing. But two points that I had for you, okay? Actually, a couple of points. One, when you're looking at creating a digital strategy for yourself, remember, I want you to go back to your personal values. How am I planning to run the business? What's your vision for the business? What's your mission for the business? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, that was not me, by the way. Did someone progress for me accidentally? Um, don't touch anything. <laughs> no one, we don't want it to get to like the last, oh no, it's, it's still moving. Why is it still moving? Um, it actually, it's fine. Cause I, you know, the, the good part guys is I've been doing this for 25 years. I know all of this information anyway. And remember that, um, Alma, um, we'll be sending you off this information anyway, so it's perfectly fine. So the point that I wanted to make to you was when I say to folks, please come up with a strategy. Okay, I see uh, um, uh, there's a mouse moving on the screen, and I'm not exactly sure who's moving it. Um, Leo, is that you trying to help me to get back? No, that's not me. It's okay. me. You need to you need to take it back. Okay. Um uh, I was checking the chat. Sorry. Okay. And so um all right. So we're 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 far progressed into my my presentation. Oh fully we will no more touching <laughs> because I want to make sure that I'm showing these guys these examples that they wouldn't normally see themselves. So again, these are things that I want to make sure that they're seeing. So 
again, strategy. When we talk about a digital strategy or a marketing strategy, I find that oftentimes people go to, okay, we're going to do this on Facebook and we're going to do this on LinkedIn. Those are not strategies. Those are tactics. Those are actions that you're taking. What I want you to think about is what you'd be discussing with um, DLCCS, uh, with Diane Camacho's company about your operations. What are you thinking about accomplishing? What you'd be discussing with Leo as you're trying to mold your company and um, figure out how you're going to improve your structure and improve. Those are the things that you're having, that's your strategy. And then your marketing would now be, okay, that would equal to, you know, we're, we're, we're going to do 100,000 this year. And these are the things that we're going to do. These are the actions that we're going to do to actually make this goal happen. And by the way, sometimes the, the goal when they get to me is we want a more visible brand because we don't like the image that we're projecting. We've worked so hard with a Diane and a Leo um, on getting things right, but now we realize that we're not presenting well to our clients. Um, so we just want a better look. That could be the goal as well. You're putting a lot of work in and then your clients get to a website. I'll tell you a quick little story. I met someone on Muni one day. She was starting her job as a brand new CPA. I said, well, how did you choose the company that you're with? And she said, well, you know, um, they sent me three really great companies and one had made me a really great offer really early. But when I got to their website, it was very outdated. It was very archaic. And in my mind, I thought, this is not a company is, who's open to growth. This is not a company who's thinking new world. And also, this is not a company that's gonna be very collaborative because if they're not embracing something new. And so I didn't wanna take that chance. And I went with the guys who had a better website. Image, whether you like it or not, the optics are important. You don't wanna do all this great work and then show up at a Zoom meeting in your pajamas and you're here in a bun or a top knot, right? It's the same thing, right? So the um, other slides that you're going to see is just a reminder then that marketing is for four reasons and four reasons only. Um, and that's what as marketers, by the way, we focus on and if you are hiring a marketer and they're not focusing on these things, you should smile and walk away. One, our main focus is revenue increase to increase your revenue. That's the big thing. You've done your, put your marching orders, you've gotten your marching orders from Diane, you've gotten your, your guidance from a, a Leo Manzione, um, and now we need to put that into action. It's to increase your revenue. Next thing is to maintain the clients that you have. You know, remember we talked about automated marketing, email marketing, communicating with them, consistent communication, retaining those clients, reaching out to them. What are the structures? And by the way, that is marketing, by the way. The next one is, of course, the most expensive, which is getting new clients. The cheapest clients that you, the business that you're ever going to get is a client that you already have because they already like you, they already love you. So it's easier to communicate with them, keep that going, get new business, ask for referral, ask them uh, to look at other services that you have. If you've done all of that right, then you become a brand, which is our fourth thing as marketers to develop brand awareness and develop you as a brand. But number one, two, and three are not going to happen. Um, uh, if they don't happen, then you can't get to being a brand. All right. Leo kind of threw it out and kind of was a, a nice starter for me, which said, you know, marketing and operations is a love story. So I can't do effective marketing for you if you haven't done that work ahead of schedule. Uh, you know, I'll give you a wonderful example. A couple of years ago, and this is a company who, who had been around for about 30 years, they did yoga and meditation uh, retreats in about six countries, and I was taking over their entire marketing team. After we went through, we literally saved them really quickly right off the bat, $25,000 per year that they had been doing for about five years. Why? Because they had started a pay-per-click campaign, but one, did not have the structure for someone who was trained 
to pick up those calls. So no one had been picking up the calls. So for five years at $25,000 a year, that money just kind of went out the window. And when you don't satisfy your client's need, as Leo had said earlier, they go to other places and listen, the stats are out there. We, sh we know that percentage wise, people will complain a lot when they're dissatisfied, but they won't share that much when they are. They're in bliss. They're like, hey, I'm happy. This, this guy I'm working with is amazing. But they have, they don't, you have to push them sometimes. Can you give me a referral? Can you say something nice for me? You know, but when they're angry, that anger has a lot of steam, you know? And so imagine how the brand had been destroyed over that period of time. You know, so we said, cut that, cut, turn that pipe off right there alone. We saved you $25,000. And if you like, we can allocate that to something else that's more productive for you. But again, as a marketer, why would I, I, the previous marketer, I don't know why they even recommended that to them because they did not have the proper operational structure set up to make something like that happen. And that's just a larger example, but oftentimes people just go again straight to tactics without really thinking about what's their strategy and can they actually make this happen. So let's jump into it. I've jumped a couple of my slides have passed by, but the thing that I wanted to point out to you guys, and the big thing is that Google SEO hadn't really changed a lot since we've started doing it years and years ago. But over the last two years or so, actually no, about a year and a half or so, Google has been starting to make some strong changes in how they interact with us, the users. They're trying to become a better company, just like we're trying to become a better company. And they've been upping their, their game on the user experience and we see it all the time lately you know you go into google and you type in and before you're about to complete google suggest is what we call it google suggests suddenly there's a drop down of all of these choices so instead of looking at the organic search that comes up us the local business owners they're not even seeing that anymore they're going straight to the drop downs right i'm sure you guys have seen that yeah and I know I do it as well. I simply choose, well, that's what I want to. Let me just choose that. Because we are more and more choosing what we call a zero click search. Um, again, it's just simply easier. They're improving my uh, use of their site. It's made it very difficult for small business owners. And again, this is not a bad thing. Google's not bad. Um, you know, although I have to say a long time ago on their mission statement, it said, do no evil. And they've quietly taken that off their mission statement, threw it out the window. Some, I don't know when it happened, but I thought that was adorable. However, at the end of the day, they're a publicly traded company. And at the end of the day, the things that they're doing are probably some things that we should be modeling as well on our marketing end, right? So it's up to us as small business owners to be really smart about what we're doing um, and to make sure that we're being found, all right? So um, I'm taking over now, guys, I'm moving forward. Um, so again, the zero click searches as increases, as you can see here from the data. And this is an old one that I could find on the numbers right now. Um, just wanna make sure that I've gotten my permission, um, but, Organic search was really big and that's how we found things. Now that's just, again, out the window. Um, and you, uh, I know as a fact, I'm kind of inter interested to see by the end of this quarter um, what the numbers are going to look like, especially now that we're sheltering in place. Hello. Come on, presentation. You can do this. Uh, wait, wait. Uh, PowerPoint went away. Hang on. And um, I think I asked, um, is there any way for me to simply share my screen? Yep. Okay, let's do that. Just share your screen. I'll okay. stop share. All right. I stopped sharing. Okay. Alrighty, um, so let me just exit out of this and simply open my, can you guys see my screen? 
Are you guys seeing my screen? Uh, I'm seeing something that I've never seen before. Um, okay, so you still haven't seen my screen. Sorry, guys. Alma, Diane, if you want to help editing this video, just let me know. Okay. <laughs> Is that you? Example zero click searches? Um, I, I'm hoping that it's me. Um, I, ah, there we go. I was trying to share my screen and it just was not initiating. Um, so I am just going to quickly click through and get to my position, guys, and start from there. Okay, let's just start from here. Yay. Okay, so let's go from here. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your patience with uh, the technology, everyone. So, all right, so I just wanted to show you a couple of examples. So this is the example that I shared with you guys about um, the, the uh, zero-click search and what that looks like. Um, and so people are getting that answer without doing the searches. Um, but the thing that's significant and that you guys need to know, and this is affecting you, is that ads are looking less like ads. Um, before, when we first started, that's the old Google logo, it was very, very clear what was an ad from the organic search. You can see the searches start right below that and in yellow, we knew that that was an ad, it was clearly stated. But now, so notice that the boxes are getting lighter in color over time. And again, because you know, I'm sharing this information with you guys and you know, as business owners, you're probably taking note of it yourself, but your clients are not seeing the difference. Now that yellow box has all been removed and the upper level are mostly ads, notice we're not even seeing any organic search on our first screen and therefore our customers aren't seeing us as well. We know that we're customers just like our customers. We're, we're not that different from them. So we're, th these are things that we're seeing and sometimes we tend to click on the first thing that we see. It's like, I need to get moving. Let me check out the top results first. And so we're getting pushed further and further. And by the guy, way, guys, this is just a result of the fact that there's just limited space and they have to consolidate it. Notice the ads are looking less like ads. We're getting shopping on top. We're still not seeing the ads until further down. And here's another example. In the screen, it's not until a way further down the bottom that we're getting the ad space. So again, my point to you guys is really, it's time for you to really take a look at SEO in a very different way. So I'll give you like a quick story here. Um, I worked with a criminal attorney a couple of months back. And when I sat down with, with him, um, you know, it was, the conversation was all about Facebook. It was a Facebook, Facebook, and I, I did some research and I was really excited. We can do this. We can engage this way. And I'm doing LinkedIn as well. But he was really interested to just share with me what he had learned and maybe, you know, we could take the step for him. Really wanted to see where he was going with this. So once he was finished, I stopped him and I said, you're a criminal attorney and let's, let's take a look at what your customer's journey looks like. I've done a very bad thing and I'm now getting hauled away by the cops and getting taken to jail. Does the first thing I do is go to Facebook and say hey to my fans or do I go to criminal attorney near me? That's not a Facebook strategy. That's a pay-per-click strategy. And so you would, you're, you're, not, you're putting monies in the wrong place when the bulk of your budget should be, let's say, pay-per-click because your specific client is in the wrong place. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? So, and it's the reason why I shared with you earlier why it's important to look at a strategy and that strategy needs to keep in mind what your customer's journey look like. I'm sure you've heard marketers say this over and over. You might have read it. The reality is customer's journey simply means zero, no knowledge of your business or you whatsoever to they know you, they're, they're there, they've repeated, they've sent referrals along to you, they have a relationship with you. Also, what was that trigger point? What happened 
right before they had to find you. And of course, we know with a criminal attorney, it's pretty straightforward that it's simply they've done something wrong or they know that they're about to get um, in trouble somehow and they need to call you. So we need to keep that in mind and make sure that we're not putting the bulk of our dollars in the wrong place. And this all comes down to your SEO strategy, which is, and for those of you who don't know it, you'll see it on the slide that was um, passed by earlier, which is search engine optimization. How do you optimize your website so that you can be properly found? So the rules. SEO, when you're considering SEO to include that, and it shouldn't just be an only strategy, we're only doing SEO right now, it needs to be also tied into your website. So if you're considering SEO, what are you planning for your website? How are you gonna up the game on your website as well? So for me, those items are going to be tied in um, before you even think of anything else. So SEO again means search engine optimization and it comes in a couple of packages. The first one is on-page SEO. That's the thing that we know. Um, this is what most people are familiar with. How we actually um, improve our website, the keyword strategies, the wording, making sure that the right items are in the background. What you guys don't know is also that this strategy needs to be paired with off-page SEO. How are you found? Is the right information out there um, in um, uh, search spaces and on the platform that people are even finding you properly? Um, I'm just gonna exit out of this two seconds and make sure that my timing is off. There we go. And so, we wanna make sure that folks are actually even finding you because a, a, oftentimes people go in and their focus is on just the website and you can't have the website as your only strategy. The strategy also has to include how people are finding you to even get to the website in the first place. So there are three items, on-page strategy, doing that cleanup work, visually, what's the user experience on the website, keyword strategy, the back end, and then the off-page SEO, how are they even finding you in the first place? Remember, oftentimes when you're first starting your business, you might have put your, your email address, an old email address in, that still might be there representing your business. Your home address may be still representing your business, and it happens. Um, a client might have done a review for you and put your phone number in incorrectly. All of these items need to be cleared up so that they can actually find you. And then your content strategy needs to be part of it as well because that needs to have your keyword strategy included in it that pulsates out to your social media, your pay-per-click, all of your other strategies, your email, your automated campaign as well. Now let's move on. I'm not gonna dive into it deep too deeply, but I wanted to make sure that I drop this little search in for you on page checklist the information is out there everywhere guys it's not that hard to find it's very deep and involved and i'd rather you just simply do a quick search for yourself and simply find the information and they're all great information so when you sit down to whoever you decide to hire you're going through this list with them are these the things that will be done i'd like to do this what do i need to do on my side so easily searchable, you're gonna search the SEO checklist for off-page SEO. Um, of course, I'm gonna do a little sell as well because we offer the service as well, so you can reach out to us. But again, these are things, if you have a great um, uh, website guy that you're working with um, and he has some skills, you can offer him this checklist and simply say, these are the things that I want you to, um, to work on heavily with, um, uh, with, uh, with my website, right? So that's for the off-page stuff. Um, but again, you still need to do the push because it's not that simple because really a lot of these uh, checklists are gonna tell you, make sure that you get onto a, a, an account with Google or an account on Yahoo or account on Bing and correct the information there. And that's easy enough to do. You can do that on your own. However, on our side for our clients, we do the cleanup work on 85 of those platforms at a time. 
that's the challenging part because now you need to go into every single one of them and create a username and password and do the cleanup work. Um, so this one is typically done by an outside company that has a technology set up and we have our platform set up that can do that for you. But besides us, there are a bunch of other folks out there. Um, so just type in off page SEO. We're not the only one out there. The on page items. Again, there's some basic things that you guys can do on your own once you see the checklist, but there's going to be a whole bunch of things that, again, either an SEO person, um, your, again, your website guy, if he's offering that service, bear in mind that because he's a website designer does not mean that he also knows SEO. So really dive into that and ask about the skill set because it is an area of focus. So on page is going to make sure that you include, again, your keyword strategy. Um, another quick one, actually, I'm, you know, something I'm going to wait until I give you some actionable items later on, because um, I did a whole bunch of them for you of things that you can either do yourself or you can actually do um, with your, your website guys. So this is something that you can do as well. So let's go through the analysis really quickly. So are you even using effectively the things that you already have? Um, and by the way, guys, um, I'm seeing some questions popping up. If you guys have questions, interrupt me. I don't mind if we're like in the middle of it and you want to ask. So Alma, if you see that someone is asking a question out there and um, I, I don't, I don't mind um, you guys just unmuting and simply asking me, you know, cause we're, we're in this new world of screen and, when I'm presenting, sometimes I can't see who's popping up questions. So if you want to unmute and simply ask, that's perfectly fine. Um, does anyone want to unmute and ask a question before I move any further in? Okay. Um, all right. I'll keep I'll keep rolling then, and I'll look at the questions after. So, are you even using what you have effectively? A lot of times I see folks spending a lot of money on these really great videos, telling their about story, sharing who they are, why you are doing what it is that you're doing. And then they put it on their LinkedIn page and they're like, it didn't work. No one, I didn't get any business from that. Of course you didn't get any business. You did not use it properly. So there are so many things that we could do with that video, even with the one video, of course, it would be great if you had the budget to do more. But with that one video, you can actually harvest that video. You can actually, there are a lot of services out there where you can actually have the audio transcribed. So you can actually break that out and now offer that on LinkedIn as a little audio file, um, just sharing your message. You know, um, by the way, LinkedIn really loves it when you share short videos from their platform. They'll definitely show those videos for you and it will get out to way more of your connections than if you just dropped in something from YouTube. A little tip for you. But you can also grab things out. Maybe there's something that you say a lot that is a quotable that you could use in a little, you know, inspiration for the day. Mine is keep moving forward. Things get tough. Take a breath. Keep moving forward. I didn't realize how often I was saying it. You can put that on a square and drop it in a visual onto your LinkedIn or your Facebook. You can break that video apart and just maybe tell small stories where maybe you did a, a one minute in the video where you just shared your mission statement, or maybe there was another 30 seconds in it where you told people about how you work with a client. Those are all pieces that you could break out from a three minute video. And now you have maybe four videos right there alone. So there's a lot that you could do with that. And like I said, even the audio could be broken out into different ends because you could transcribe it and turn those into pieces of newsletters as well. So there's a lot that you can do with what you already have. So are you using what you already have effectively? Um, so again, I dropped in the primary reasons why you market um, because I really want to uh, really push that to you guys. So your website strategy, again, is really also an SEO strategy and how you effectively manage that website also includes your um, SEO management. So again, 
because this is an area where folks aren't too sure about, oftentimes it gets um, left out. And it is, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, it is a very expensive end, but there are so many things that you could do on the checklist that you can actually do yourself. And by the way, if you're planning to work with an SEO person, now you've sat down and done some of those work so that you can have a proper conversation with them about what their customer journey looks like so they can find them at each one of those points and start having the conversation and making them aware about your business and who you are and trying to push them to your website again as a foundation to get them to a webinar or to get them to click an appointment, whatever your goal is. What is your goal when they hit your website? Is it to book an appointment? Is it to get your story? Is it to see your case studies and then book an appointment? What is the process that you want that client to take? Is the website that you have right now, if I go to your website or a potential client, would they know what to do when they land on your page? Or are they pelted by a lot of information or no information? I mean, I've seen those as well where they're really sexy website, they're gorgeous, they're beautiful and visual. And then I get there and I go, navigation, gorgeous photo, name of business, what do I, the longer folks sit and try to figure out what to do, the more they're, they're apt to bounce out and leave. We've done the work to get them there, you know, whether you're refer, um, doing referral based marketing and they're going over there to check you out or you've connected with some great referral partners and they've sent them over there um, or you've just been doing some marketing on your own to send them over as well. We don't want to confuse them. We want to tell them the story because people want they're there. So they obviously they've taken one big step to you making them into your client. They've gotten there to check something out. All right. So um, here are some solutions to enhance your, your tactical day-to-day -day marketing efforts. Remember, SEO does not exist in a vacuum, guys. Um, it's about creating an overall plan and selecting promotional elements that work together and work for you. It's not a ditto situation. Um, one of the ones that I see often with social media is folks figuring, I should do everything. Um, I just um, had a great conversation with a really cool IT guy recently. My big question to him, why do you have like seven uh, social media sites? You have Pinterest. Why do you have Pinterest? Why do, why do you have Instagram? You know, so there, was, there are things that needs, if you're going to spend the time and effort to do it, it needs to tie in to your overall strategy who you are and how you run your business, you don't have to choose everything and then do them badly. I'd rather you see you do three or four things in your overall strategy and do those well and make sure that they're complementing and working uh, together. Paula, okay. Paula, yes? Uh, we are down to four minutes. So okay. can you wrap it up in a minute? I can definitely wrap it up in a minute. I gave you guys all of these low lying nuggets to help you. Um, and I listed like a whole bunch of them. Content sprouting is one that we talked about before. Um, another great one is check your, um, your page speed, check for any technical errors. We talked about content sprouting. Um, I dropped in um, the SEO is not just brand building, but for exposure. Um, oh, a big one that I see that um, a lot of lawyers have is zombie pages. Those are a lot of content and dead pages that you're no longer using that are on the back end of your website. Google views those badly and will drop you further on the list of pages. So remove them or uh, close them out for a while or update them, um, or you can refresh them as new. I see that one being a big problem a lot. Is your security there? Um, here are a couple of tools that you can use, um, and these are all free items from Google, so you're not having to spend for it. You just put your information in, and it will give you the information back about your mobile speed, uh, what you suggest is your Google Planner, and your speed of your site, um, and also the crawl, and if there's any errors. So here are some tools that will actually help you. Um, again, when you are putting together your strategy, please think of it in the following steps. They need to be aware of you. What's the steps that you're going to use to, for them to consider you? 
How are you going to convert them? And how are you going to maintain the clients that you have? I offer a 20 minute free marketing session. Um, no obligations in this crazy world that we're in right now. It's just my way, my gift to you to help get you unstuck um, and you know, maybe help move you forward, but you get a chance to see who I am and share with me as well. I will drop that in um, to Diane, offer that to you as well. And let Thank me you. unshare and hand it back to you, Diane. Uh, that's okay, just flick to the last page and we're good. Thank you. Um, so we have just a couple of minutes left. I want to give you your last clue or your last word clue, which is cup, C-U-P. So if you remember that word as well, when Alma sends out your survey, that would be great. I want to thank Paula and Leo for your time and for your great information. And we will um, send out information well you'll get the slides and you'll also get information about the uh, aba and california bar association rules on marketing and advertising does anybody have any questions